During life's journey, we often seek to know God's will and to understand our purpose. So we search, we question, we seek guidance. And just as clay yields to the potter's touch, we surrender to God's plan. When we trust God, we are transformed. The hands of the divine potter shape us, refining our purpose and molding our hearts. Our lives take on a new meaning as we align with God's will. We become his instrument of love, compassion, and blessing through our journey of knowing God and doing God's will. We find strength and courage and unity and a deeper connection with God. Just as clay transformed by the potter, God makes you complete, shaping you into what you were meant to be. Uh, we are in week two of our series, Knowing and Doing God's Will, and this morning we are honored to have a guest speaker, Dr. Walter Kim. Uh, Walter Kim is the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. Uh, the person who held that position previous to Walter is our own pastor emeritus, Leif Anderson. And so our connections with the NAE run deep, and we are so grateful to have Walter here this morning. Walter became the president of the National Association of Evangelicals in January of 2020. He previously served as the pastor at Boston's historic Park Street Church and at churches in Vancouver, Canada, and Charlottesville, Virginia, as well as the campus chaplain at Yale University. He preaches, writes, and engages in collaborative leadership to connect the Bible to the intellectual and cultural issues of the day. He regularly teaches at conferences and classrooms, addresses faith concerns with elected officials and public institutions, and provides theological and cultural commentary to leading news outlets. He serves on the board of Christianity Today and World Relief and consults with a wide range of organizations. Kim received his PhD from Harvard University in near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, his MDiv from Regent College in Vancouver, and his BA from Northwestern University. And I will add that a few years ago, I reached out to Walter in my search for trying to understand how can we as a church best address the challenges that we face in the increasingly post-Christian era that we find ourselves. And Walter was so kind to give me his time, and what I found from Walter was not only sound uh, biblical and a theological perspective to help navigate, Walter, you gave me great hope. And I'm so thankful for uh, our relationship and uh, your words uh, for us here at Wooddale. So Wooddale, would you please welcome Walter Kim. Thank you, Kyle, for that very kind introduction, for the invitation to be here at Wooddale, but increasingly so. Thank you, Kyle, for your friendship and collaboration in the ministry of the gospel. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. As uh, Kyle shared, Leith Anderson had been my predecessor. He had set an amazing foundation for me, which he handed off in January of 2020, and I have often noted his timing was impeccable of when to leave <laughs> just before the pandemic. But I am profoundly grateful for the ways that Wooddale, uh, through Leith's leadership, but also through the ways that you do life and live out that life in Christ that is a model to many throughout the country, indeed the world. As the guest preacher, I am not privy to all the joys and trials that you face, the hopes and hurts that you may have, but, but I'm going to make a prophecy this morning. I'm going to prophesy that you have just come out of, are in, or will soon have a difficult circumstance in your life. <laughs> Pretty safe to say, right? Because that is life. So for many years on my own, office desk has been a piece of art given to me by some colleagues. 
It is crafted in the kintsugi style, which in Japanese means gold mending. It's a particular way of taking and making pottery by rejoining broken shards, and instead of discarding them, joining them with lacquer or gold and silver powder. Brokenness is not rejected, it is remade. So sometimes during the day, uh, I will pause and I will look and hold that piece of pottery as a reminder that ministry, really life in general, is about being new creations remade from the broken shards of an old creation. So in his classic work, The Wounded Healer, Henry Nouwen offers this profound insight about life in Christ. He writes, nobody escapes from being wounded. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not, how can we hide our wounds so that we don't have to be embarrassed? But how can we put our woundedness into the service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and becomes a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. I think it's safe to say that all of us have some fractures in our life. We have something that we would rather hide from others than put it on display. And yet it is in our fractures, it's in our woundedness that God sees us. And then he sends us. So would you join me uh, in opening up to Exodus chapter 3. Page 83 in your pew Bibles or whatever else you would do uh, to access the word of God. Before I read the passage, I want to invite you into a moment of silence. As I said, I, I don't know the particular fractures in your life. I don't know what you bring into today's worship service as a wound. Maybe you barely know, maybe you're barely able to articulate it. But let's just pause for a moment and ask God to meet us precisely in the ways that we are fractured, that we might be remade by him. So let's give each other this gift of silence before the Lord. Search us, O oh God, know our hearts, see if there's any hurtful way, and, and in seeing that about us, heal us, remake us, take the shards, and redeem for your glory in Christ's name, amen. Exodus 3, verses 1 through 12. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good 
and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you, that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. In our fractures, in our woundedness, God sees us. So, he had been adopted as Pharaoh's daughter. Moses grew up with this extraordinary privilege in the palace of the Pharaoh. At 40 years old, Moses was a prince of Egypt at the prime of life. But it was at that time, in an act, rash act of violence, he was rejected by his people, pursued by Pharaoh, fled like a fugitive. And now, 40 years later, here at the age of 80, he is wandering in the wilderness looking for grass for his sheep. Packed into the opening verse is 40 years of futility. And in all the feelings, emotions, the hammers of disappointment that have beat against Moses. And there are a myriad of reasons for his reluctance that actually speaks to our reluctance to pursue God's will. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness. He came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Moses is a refugee in Midian. Far from being the ultimate insider in Egypt, he is now the ultimate outsider in Midian. And he's not even in Midian right now. He is wandering on the far side of the wilderness, at least several weeks journey. Doing what? Looking for grass because he's a shepherd. And of course, being a shepherd for him would have been a, a tremendous shame. We know from Genesis 46 that the Egyptians despised the occupation of shepherds. So for 40 years, he had grown up with this belief that you could be anything, just don't be a shepherd. And here he is, a shepherd. A refugee, a shepherd, but he doesn't even own his own flock. He is shepherding the flock of his father-in-law. That's a complicated relationship. <laughs> and, wow, he is a religious minority. He's a follower of Yahweh living in the household of a priest of Midian. He has every reason to believe that life has passed him by. The many fractures of his life, surely they are good reasons for reluctance. But in the hand of God, there are reasons for readiness. If his time in the courts of Pharaoh had prepared him to re-enter as an emissary to Pharaoh, it is his time in the desert that prepared his heart, his character, that developed in him the dependence and humility necessary to serve God. It was actually in the wandering of the wilderness that he got the training to lead the people of God through the wilderness. And so we read in Numbers 12, 3, Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone on the face of the earth. I mean, imagine having said that about you. Imagine having said that, you know, to anyone else, I speak through prophecies, but to Moses, I, I speak face to face. It required him to wander in the desert, to sense the hammer of life upon him, to be fractured into the shards, 
so that he could be remade into a beautiful piece of God's providence. What makes you unsure about your life? I'm not as pretty, I'm not as popular as that other person. I'm not as smart, I'm not as well-networked. I don't have this or that asset of life. I don't come from the right family. I don't have the gifts. Oh, the failures, the things I struggle with. If only they knew how insecure I was. And maybe most devastating of all, if people really understood how much I felt forgotten and forsaken by God, we all have something. Something that we feel keenly as a fracture. And God invites us in that moment as we come clean with him, understanding our fractures, that God comes to us and he says, you know what? I see you. I see you. The passage literally says that. Verse 4. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called him to himself from a bush. God sees, then God summons to himself. And how does he do that? He says, Moses, Moses. Yeah, but we all know that there are different ways of calling people. Was it Moses, Moses? Get over here. Or was it, you know, Moses? Moses? Is that you? How, did, how was God talking? Well, in Scripture, whenever names are repeated twice, there was this kind of ancient Near Eastern practice that it was an actual invitation, an expression of intimacy. So when King David lost his son, he cries out, Absalom, Absalom. My son, my son. When God summons the boy Samuel to be his prophet, he whispers, Samuel, Samuel. When Jesus looks at that frenzied and frantic woman trying to be a host, he says, Martha, Martha, you're worried about many things. God sees Moses and all the fractures. And he summons Moses with tenderness. A tenderness that even shapes his holiness. Don't come any closer. Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And then Moses, he's afraid. He's afraid to look at God. Now, is he afraid to look at God because he's ashamed of himself? Perhaps. But from the passage, we get an overwhelming sense that has worked out through Scripture. That the fear of looking at God is because of being overwhelmed by his goodness. You see... Hollywood is able to create figures of such intense evil that we are scared. When we go to the movies and, ooh, jump scare. Wow, we have nightmares from that terrifying figure, whatever that movie might be. Hollywood has never been able to create a figure of such incredible goodness, kindness, faithfulness, that we are terrified by it. A God who would keep his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A faithfulness that is so intense that it just overwhelms us. And we can scarcely deal with the implications of that. That God would pursue us that hard? And yet that's what we have here. What is it about God that you need to know? How is it 
that you need to hear God summon you today. Walter, Walter. He sees. He sees you and he summons you. And as he summons you, he invites you into this great work of saving. So we read in verse 7 a, a series of descriptions of God's response to what he sees as he summons. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery. I have heard their cries. I am concerned about their suffering. And I have come down to rescue and to bring them into a good and spacious land. God intensely moves toward us. Even when we feel forgotten and forsaken by God. He's watching for that moment of openness. When he can catch your attention with the burning bush. Like when Moses first saw the burning bush, he didn't know it was a supernatural event. The passage says, that's a strange sight. Uh, maybe he was just looking around saying, whose fire is this and wh where are they? Sometimes God catches our attention and we can't even recognize it's him. But we come a little bit closer. And as we come closer, God sees and he meets us. Oh. And when he meets us, he reveals to us his plan to rescue and to bring us to a good land. And is this not what God did in Jesus? Is this not a foreshadowing of the great work of salvation? That God saw us in our lostness. That he heard our cries that he showed the concern and that he came down himself. And at a different tree, he spread out his arms on a cross to save us, to bring us to a good and spacious promised land, a land of his people, of his kingdom. Do we sense that deep invitation of God? Are we inviting others into that invitation of Christ? God sees. God summons. God saves. And we need to slow down and savor that. In what way do you need to know that he just sees you? He sees what's going on. In what ways do you need to be reminded that he hears your cries? In what ways do you need to trust that he is coming down? Help is on the way. And as God meets us, he sends us with his presence and his promise. But, God said to, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Ancient formula of, of kind of self-humiliation. Who am I? Who am I to do this? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You will worship God on this mountain. God sees, God summons, God sends us with his presence and promise. Of course, his promise wasn't fulfilled right away. He still had to bring the people out and get them to this mountain. And as the story unfolds in the rest of Exodus, that took a lot of doing. And he had to have that faith that one day that promise would be fulfilled. I don't know when the promise will be fulfilled in your life. A month? A year? Will it take ten plagues to get there? It may not be fulfilled in your lifetime. It may await the promised land that has yet to come in the new heavens and the new earth. But you are not forsaken. You are not forgotten. So my coming to Christ 
as a junior high person, was followed up in high school. I didn't, I didn't particularly grow up in a deeply Christ-following household, and so when I became a Christian uh, in my junior high years and went into high school, I'd begun to experience these radical transformations in my life. So I went into to ministry after college uh, with this deep urge to share Jesus. But there came a point in my early 20s where it all seemed to fall apart. And I was actually a campus chaplain at that point, as Kyle alluded to. And I was sharing my faith and seeing people come to Christ and leading Bible studies. I was talking about Jesus and having my devotionals. But nothing seemed to work the same way anymore. I just didn't feel God. I felt forsaken. And that wasn't just a month. It was not just a year. It was a couple, several years that I was experiencing this. One day, uh, I, I was just so exhausted from that that I came home, lay down in my bed in the afternoon. I couldn't even finish out a day of ministry. And as I lay down, I kind of slipped into this daydream. It's not that this happens to me on a regular basis. I slipped into this daydream. And in this daydream, I saw myself in a boat being tossed around by the waves. For a while, I could see through the clouds the North Star, and I tried to direct myself, but eventually the clouds covered the North Star, and I didn't know where I was going. And I couldn't row hard enough to fight the waves. So I just gave up. And then I sensed that I was coming to a shore, and on the shore it was just gleaming white sand. If you get to know me, I'm a pretty melodramatic person, so I knew what was happening. I, I, I was about to see Jesus in this dream. And uh, I looked at myself, and I was a mess. I I didn't even have the strength to row toward the shore. I just waited for the the waves to lap me in that direction. And when I fell out of the boat, I was not just looking like a mess, I smelled like a mess. I was so ashamed of myself. So as I sensed in this kind of daydream that Christ was approaching me, I could barely look up. And then I sense very deeply the warmth and tenderness of Christ. The Walter, Walter. Then I heard him say, in my mind, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. I wish I can say that I instantly woke up and I no longer had any struggles. It didn't happen that way. It persisted. But what I vowed as I got out of that bed was, I may never feel Jesus again in my life. But I have seen enough of God to know that he is with me. And this may be prophetic. That all I can do one day is just let the waves of life push me to that shore and I'll be a stinky mess. But I know that that's okay with God. That he sees me. That he hears me. That he's concerned. And that he has come down. And he will one day welcome us all. Those who claim Jesus, even if it's just by your fingernails. And he will say, welcome. Welcome home. However your life may be fractured, God sees you. God summons you. God saves you. And yes, he will send you to do likewise in this world. 
Let's pray. Moses, Moses. Martha, Martha. You call to us. You know our fractures. And you are not ashamed. You see us. You welcome us. Help us to go to whatever that bush is in our lives that is you trying to catch our attention. Meet us. Grant us the wisdom to use our failures and futility well, that we might be remade in Christ. In his name and to his glory we pray. Amen.